I'm so excited to be here at the new space with the Nerd Night back again after so long. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about a very misunderstood subject and much maligned, character optimization in Dungeons and Dragons. Let's see if the button works. Oh, -ho. so first let's talk about some vocab. Uh, does everybody know what a tabletop role-playing game is? I feel like probably a few people here might. Raise your hand if you've never played a tabletop role-playing game of any kind. That's amazing. So, very briefly, uh, it's a game where you assume the role of some character and you act in the setting as that character. Virtual tabletops have become a lot more common during the pandemic. Uh, you can go on Roll20.net, for example, not an endorsement, uh, and Discord and all kinds of platforms so you can play online with your friends. So I'll skip some of these other details since we're all fairly familiar, but who can tell me what a munchkin is in a D&D context? player who just wants to hack and slash and typically turn on their, their entire party while they're at it and grab treasure. Thank you. That is perfect. Also references the Steve Jackson games box we've got there. Also not an endorsement. Uh, but yeah, Munchkin is kind of the bad image of an optimizer, someone who's just trying to get as much power and goodies as possible. And that's not what we're about. Min-maxing is sometimes used the same way, but min-maxing is just a strategy. Min-maxing is when I dump my charisma stat so that I can have a higher intelligence stat. And lastly, rules as written versus rules as intended is kind of a can of worms, but the short of it is that the rules are complicated. And that was very dramatic, but did not work. <laughs> and it did not work again. Hey, so, why is it that we're talking about Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition of all the systems that are out there tonight? Well, the first reason is that everybody knows about it. It's super popular, I don't know, like it was on Stranger Things, it's all over the place. So, it's what people are playing, so we might as well play it better. Why else, though? It's deceptively simple. The rules function through exceptions. And that means that if you read them very closely and carefully and thoughtfully, you can do all kinds of wacky things. So what is optimization, though? Simply put, it's intentionally choosing character options to create a particular way that you can play the game. There are a lot of different options to choose from, as you may be able to see here, or may not, depending on your seating and the angle of viewing. But you've got your race or lineage, your background, your ability scores, your proficiencies, and so much else. So if you put them together in the right way, you can create very particular mechanical effects. There is, however, a prerequisite, a shared understanding of the rules. Don't go ahead and put together your character and then come to the table and have your god wizard or whatever and suddenly your dungeon master goes, you just did what? So you always want to clear it with them first. And when we're talking to the optimization community out there, like on the interwebs, we do have a loose weave general consensus about how the rules work so that we can communicate about builds. Now, some things that optimization is not. Optimization is not characterization. You're not becoming your character more fully by putting together rules in clever ways. So it's not role-playing. It's also not combat tactics, but it can support combat tactics very effectively. And also, it's not the whole game. Some people might need that as a reminder. It's not. It's super fun in and of itself, but ultimately optimization is just one tool in your toolkit for having a good time at the table. 
So why do it? Again, a good time. If you're a nerd, you might find it enjoyable to pour through those rules and look at the minutia and figure out what you can combine with what to create what particular wild effect. And then you get to play it. It's kind of like cooking, where you can enjoy the process and then you can also enjoy the outcome. And you can also use it for teamwork. Because if you figure out what your role in the party will be, you can define it clearly, then your teammates know what to expect and they can adapt their strategies to that. So the three pillars of Dungeons and Dragons, as some of you may know, are combat, social interaction, and exploration. Really, the one pillar of D&D is combat, and that's because of its roots as a war game, if we're being really honest here, which we are. But that doesn't mean that you can only optimize for combat. There are rules for these other areas. You just have to know them, make sure your dungeon master knows them, and figure out together how you can combine them in fun ways. So this is really a false dichotomy, but there are two general sorts of approaches that I like to describe optimization tidbits as, either streamlining or synergizing. So streamlining, by that I just mean you're making the stuff that your character does happen more effectively. So if I'm making attacks, maybe I give myself advantage on those attack rolls, if you know what that particular term means, you 5e players. And if you don't, well, it's pretty much what it sounds like. We won't worry about that now, but feel free to ask me later. But uh, you can see here, though, the plus one hat and the plus two shirt. This is an example, too. You can use your magic items. You can stack your armor class bonuses so that you're harder and harder to hit. And uh, one more aside on this slide. If you would like some examples of game-changing synergies, the first one I'll recommend off of the Tabletop Builds website is the Ghost Lance. It is wild. Now, roles in combat, if we really think about it, who here has played an MMO? And I'm assuming if I say MMORPG, the same hands will stay up. So there, <laughs> more or less. Uh, so there are three main roles in these massively multiplayer online role-playing games uh, for combat encounters. The tank, the support, and the DPS. The tank is the one who takes all the punishment from the enemy. Support could be a healer or could be someone who buffs allies, like maybe casting the Bless spell in D&D or debuffs enemies, like casting the Bane spell in D&D. And then DPS is short for damage per second. They do damage and also damage. Now, the thing about a tank that I didn't realize before I played an MMO myself is that they have to have a taunt ability. This is something that makes the enemy go after them. Because you could be super tanky decked out in your you know, magical plus three plate armor, and then the enemy takes one look at you and goes, nope, I'm gonna attack the wizard. So there are a couple character classes and abilities that can do that, and you just kinda wanna look at that as you go, like what gives me the abilities? Spoiler for tank, there are really only two options for taunt. Three technically, but we'll skip the third one. Armorer Artificer with the Guardian model in fifth edition, and the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. Now, we also combine these with tactical positions. Am I a frontliner? Am I hit and run, which is very rogue? Am I in the second row, like maybe a, a bard? Or am I in the very back row because I am squishy? <laughs> so if you combine one of these classic MMORPG roles with your position in the lineup, you can figure out what choices to make, what trade-offs are worth it to build the character that plays the way you want. Now, who here has heard of a party face? All right, couple people, not many, okay. So the face, traditionally in tabletop role-playing games, is the one who really shoulders the social interactions, uh, you know, so you can get back to that combat so the face is usually very charismatic. And in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, 
we can be that with the charisma stat, as you might imagine, but there are other things we can do in social interactions, and they're mostly driven by the way that ability scores correspond to different skills. So wisdom is more about being aware, whether it's awareness of your surroundings or awareness of whether that goblin is telling the truth. And intelligence is more for the like deduction. You need a little bit of wisdom as well to be perceptive if you want to be like a Sherlock Holmesian character, but you also need investigation. Quick note on that, investigation versus perception. So many people get this wrong. Perception is about noticing details. Investigation is about putting two and two together with the details that you've noticed. So right here, I'm not gonna get too far into this. I've actually, this is available online, this whole slide deck. Uh, so you can refer to this later, but an example of a synergizing approach to optimization is this combo here. So what we've done is combined the actor feat, which lets you impersonate other people with your voice, with the mask of many faces warlock invocation, which lets you cast disguise self as many times as you want. So you can look like anybody, and you can act like anybody super convincingly. And this opens up a whole other avenue of play because outside of combat, all of a sudden, you're in any kind of trouble. You just become someone else. And the real kicker, the thing that they won't mention most of the time when this build comes up, is the friend's cantrip. It makes you more successful in social interactions. Some of us could use that sometimes. But... The really interesting part is when it ends, the target that you used it on becomes hostile to you. You know what happens if you're disguised when it ends? They become hostile to who they think you are. <laughs> and that's why friends with optimization is the most powerful cantrip in the game. Imagine the shenanigans you could pull off with that. Now, one last point though, and that's teamwork. If I do a build like that, and the rest of my party is optimized for combat, they might not be having a good time between fights. But there's an easy way to fix that, and that is proficiency in a disguise kit. Get them disguised too, everybody can go and be spies for a while before they get into the next fight. Now, just very quickly, some essential things for optimizing for a martial character, a character that's going to be fighting with weapons. Uh, extra attack, you definitely want that. And you'll probably want one of the three options below it uh, in terms of feat selection, if feats are allowed at your table. Great Weapon Master boosts your damage tremendously if you're using a heavy weapon. Sharpshooter plus Crossbow Expert is also a, an even more tremendous damage boost. And lastly, Sentinel and Polearm Master is amazing for locking down enemies, keeping them stuck in one place. One last point on this slide. The difference between damage, the way it works for rogues versus other martial classes. Rogues don't get extra attack. They can benefit from it in a multi-class, but they deal their sneak attack damage up to once per turn. Now, there's a couple things that that implies, but the first thing to keep in mind is that you only need to hit once as a rogue to deal the bulk of your damage. The other thing that's super wild is if you use your reaction to make an attack as a rogue outside of your own turn, but on someone else's, you deal sneak attack damage again. Teamwork. Now for casters, the main thing is exactly as Yoda urges us to do is to be able to concentrate. And that's why we probably want the Warcaster feat or Resilient Constitution or the Mind Sharpener infusion from our Artificer pal. We also want Armor Proficiency if we can get it. It's um, a very popular choice to put, take, start with a level of Fighter to get Proficiency in Constitution saves for those concentration checks. Or to maybe do Cleric because that doesn't delay your spell casting, well, your spell slot progression. It does delay your spells known. That can be confusing too, but feel free to ask me questions about any of these things um, when we have a chance. 
So there's a lot to be said about getting started, but the main thing is just check out all the amazing content that's available online. There are communities for optimization out there. There are reading material galore. If you don't want to read, you can watch a YouTube video. There's tons, and they're good. And also grab a copy of this slide deck. Uh, URL may be visible here. Uh, I'll give you a second, but there's going to be a longer shot at the end where you can see it. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just do the later one. OK, so quick notes on DPR, which you may have heard about, which is damage per round. Mostly DPR is kind of sus. And the reason for that is that typically people just assume that they're hitting. Or if they don't, then they assume they're hitting at a particular percentage of the time. But enemy armor class varies. So you might have a 60% chance to hit this enemy, but a 70% chance to hit that one, and only a 30% chance on another one. So it's all guesswork. You can talk about the average damage if you do hit, but the rest, eh. So one last note on damage per round to consider is that sharpshooter and great weapon master, those feats, they're super powerful for burst boosting your damage. But because they decrease your chance to hit, if you're doing a proper expected value calculation, expected damage, then you're taking that into account and reducing it because it's actually the percent chance you have to hit times the damage that's your expected damage. Now, let's talk briefly about some common concerns that come up with optimization. Some dungeon masters, when they hear that you're going to optimize at their table, become very concerned. Because what about the game balance? What about challenging the players? And are you just going to hog the spotlight the whole time? You're dealing like hundreds of damage in a single round? Like what? And also, are you going to argue? Are you going to be a rules lawyer at your table? Tell the dungeon master they're wrong about their interpretation? Hold up the whole game? No, you're not. Of course not because you're a considerate person and a considerate player, and you have learned, oh, did I double? Yes, I did. I'm gonna hit the, there we go. Okay, you have learned that this is about teamwork. So you wanna do the thing, you wanna make your build, figure it out with the dungeon master ahead of time, and just have a good time. So the dungeon master can challenge you by varying the encounters, if you're a DM. You know, not every enemy has to attack the same way or be on the same terrain, mix it up. Sometimes the players will shine, sometimes they'll struggle, and that really keeps it interesting. And as a player, yeah, just, to, just follow that social contract. Be a good teammate. So here is a wall of text with resources. Once again, if you go to the bit.ly page, or link, you'll be able to download this whole thing and get these. I think we haven't updated the back one yet. Ah, it's on a delay. OK. There we go. And now that it's updated, here's the next one. So I also want to encourage all of you to check out other tabletop role-playing games, because as so many of us have found in our lives, just because something is the default doesn't mean it's what's right for us. Doesn't mean it's what's going to be the most fun for us. So here's a list of some other games I would highly encourage you to check out. Uh, most notably, uh, Blades in the Dark, if you've ever read The Lies of Locke Lamora, or if you're ever into a low fantasy uh, kind of setting with a little bit of uh, you know, heist element to it, and by a little bit I mean a lot, you'll love it. And some of these games are more story-driven, narrative-driven than combat-driven, and, and also than die roll-driven. It's hard to really get into, but yeah, so. Oh yeah, well, there's a couple books that might be neat, uh, but I haven't read them, so I won't comment on them. <laughs> the main thing is to have fun, people. So I hope that you have gotten some inspiration from this talk, and I hope that you enjoy your tabletop games at your table. Thank you.
Is this on? Yeah. Oh, I. So, I don't know why Josh went and sat down, because this is Q&A time, so I'm not sure what's, what's happening here, but no one's really sure what's happening here. Everything is just kind of like, hey, what's up? So, in keeping with the theme, do we have any live real person questions? I think we might. I don't know. Have any questions? All right, great. What's your question? And make sure that it's a question. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, so the D4 channel on YouTube, uh, are you familiar with it? Uh, he does like spreadsheets and stuff, and I'm wondering if you've dug into the spreadsheets and you trust his, his numbers. All right, just to rephrase for, uh, for the stream in case that didn't come through, how about them spreadsheets? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, one of the channels that's actually uh, linked on YouTube. Uh, from this presentation, it's the D4, the D&D Deep Dive. Do I trust his numbers? So I haven't looked at them. I trust them to a degree um, for the reasons outlined before that you can only trust any numbers for damage output to a degree. They make assumptions, and those assumptions may or may not apply. But that channel is a really fun one if you're looking for inspiration on what sort of character to create from a conceptual angle. Because I, I like Colby's channel because he does that in much the same way that I do. Uh, it's really fun to put together the pieces and be, say, who can I create with this? Uh, but yeah, so the answer is mostly in as much as one can. All right, so questions. I didn't look over here before. Are there any questions over on here this side? All right, cool. Let's try. Oh, yes. All right, exciting. Finally. What a day, just walking around all over. What you got? Uh, very excitingly, very nerdy question. Um, what's your opinions on like constrained maximization with respect to like Tasha's quadrant and everything, lineages can like get the plus one or plus two in anything. Do you think that's like a f more fun for optimizers because you could do new crazy things or like it makes everything easy because constrained maximization is fun? Something maximization, I lost the thread, but what you got? So I actually am not familiar with that term, uh, but I can speculate as to what you mean, which is that, um, tell me if this is right, uh, that there are some options that are so good that you kind of have to take them. Okay, oh right, so the movable stats. Um, yeah, I think the move, movable stats are good. These, this is an option that comes up in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, one of the more recent source books. Uh, yeah, it, it enables flexibility. I think it should be easy to build the type of character that you want to play, and that makes it easier. On the other hand, custom lineage uh, is one of those options that's so good that it becomes the default, because you get to choose everything and you get a feat right at level one, much like Variant Human before it. So I really like what Treant Monk, who's another of these content creators on YouTube, has to say about options, which is, if there's an option that's so good that you have to take it, it's not an option anymore. And that does kind of sour the game. Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master are great examples of this as well. So the best thing to do as a dungeon master, if you want to open up those options, is find house rules that will make them no longer required, like adding a power attack option to all characters. And I want to take one from Twitter just for fun. So, dun dun dun. Do these optimization tricks translate to other areas of life? <laughs> yes, which is why I am independently wealthy. So, no, but kind of. They translate to other areas of life in that just starting to think about synergies, thinking about the ways that any kind of system that functions. Uh, has these interactions, the ways that you can combine things to produce effects you want. So I would say yes, if you're open to that. Right. So, okay. so, so much, so much stress. All right, I want to start back here. I'm going to start, end up there. So, here we go. Make it good. No pressure. 
Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Sorry, this is slightly off topic, but um, any advice on finding a dungeon master? Any advice on finding a dungeon master? Presumably uh, in the game playing scenario, that was last month for the other one. So. Yeah, no, this is... <laughs> oh, I wanted to make that joke. But yes, so the best advice I can give with that is just uh, participate on social media with uh, content that's engaged around this. Like on Facebook or on Discord, you can find a lot of groups about optimization or just about D&D &D and tabletop in general. And you can find looking for group, LFG for short. There's often a channel on a Discord server or even entire groups that are dedicated to that. People say who they are, what kind of game they're running, and what kinds of players they're looking for, availability and all that, and boom, you're good. Also, feel free, uh, y'all, to ask me other questions during the intermission and then after the next talk, if you have anything else, rules-related or optimization. Wonderful. We've got one more person that I promised could ask a question, so you've got to wrap it up with a really good one. You promise? Yeah. All right. As promised, this is the best question you'll be asked. <laughs> what is your favorite optimization? What is your favorite optimization? Well, sort of tying it back with Adam's talk from last month, uh, I have a character I used in a one-shot recently named Sybil Disobedience. She is a whip-wielding halfling, blade singer 6, arcane trickster 9, and makes absolute music out of the action economy. Once again, with a whip. <laughs> All right, I feel like that's a note to end on. So. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Josh.